So, welcome to the part 2 of the lesson on thermal modeling as part of the analysis and modeling of welding course online course from NPTEL. So, uh, we have a small recap of what we discussed in the part 1. So, we were discussing that there is something called a domain and then there is a boundary. So, in our case the workpiece itself is the domain and the surroundings will be coming under boundary which means that the thermal modeling is to be done for the domain which is workpiece and uh, we are going to apply anything else that is happening around the workpiece in the boundary conditions. And uh, here is the governing equation that we derived with a very uh, simple methodology of uh, enthalpy balance and uh, we have arrived at this equation where alpha is the thermal diffusivity, Q is the heat generation in the volume of the workpiece which means that the current is going through it you would have something there otherwise normally it can be taken as 0 in solids that are isolated and having no reactions that are going on. Rho C p are the properties of the solid phase for which we did this equation derivation, rho is the density and C p is the heat capacity and uh, uh, we then have uh, posed the problem of uh, thermal modeling as solving this governing equation subject to the initial and boundary conditions. Now, the initial conditions are nothing but what are the temperatures at every location in the domain uh, and uh, at uh, normally uh, ambient temperature will be applied but then there are situations where preheating is to be given. So, this temperature can be the preheat temperature for the initial condition. And the boundary conditions are to be taken as two parts one is the heat source which is coming on the surface of the weldment and then the heat removal processes through conduction, convection and radiation and all the walls that are relevant. Okay. So, that poses the problem uh, completely and we will be able to proceed to do the thermal modeling of the solid. Now, if, uh, if you uh, want to uh, proceed further we need to make one analysis uh, namely whether this is applicable for every part of the domain. So, uh, to make that point clear what we do is that we look at the assumptions that are behind this equation. So, what are the assumptions? So, that uh, list of assumptions will tell us uh, what are the limitations. So, the first assumption is that originally we had while writing the uh, thermal uh, balance uh, heat balance uh, using the enthalpy for a control volume uh, we wrote saying that enthalpy per unit enthalpy per unit volume we wrote it as uh, rho C p into T and then the reference temperature is being ignored because it is anyway going to be uh, differentiated later on and uh, this means that these properties are to be taken for uh, the solid. Okay. So, naturally uh, this equation is valid only when this particular relationship is valid. So, if you want you can actually apply it to the liquid domain also, uh, but then you have to take the liquid properties, okay. but you cannot take both of them simultaneously and we will see the uh, reason why we are having. And another assumption uh, is that it is valid only when the thermal conductivity and uh, the parameters that are there are location independent. which means that uh, where we have a strong uh, temperature dependence of these properties and because temperature itself is dependent on the location as we solve uh, then we need to then separate this term expand and uh, not have alpha but k there and rho C p should be taken out. Okay. So, by and large otherwise in the domain uh, we are set and uh, we would like to now address this part by looking at the liquid domain. So, what happens in the longitudinal section uh, for the weld is clear here we can see that uh, as you have the heat source moving you have the liquid melt pool that will be moving and uh, behind the heat source the liquid melt pool will solidify to give the solid weld and this is the rest of the base material that is untouched and you can expand and shrink different regions to uh, match the different uh, welding conditions. So, in this region what is happening is that in the front part the melting process is taking place and in the back part the solidification process is taking place and this melt pool. Uh, is uh, not necessarily uh, quiescent uh, and therefore, we can uh, then uh, uh, put a question mark what happens if the liquid pool is not that means, there is a flow. Okay. So, if there is a uh, flow or advection then what to do. Okay. So, that is something that we need to address and we will come to that in a moment. 
Okay. So, we have made the problem uh, definition, we have put the uh, equation in the transient mode and then we have put the boundary conditions, initial condition etcetera. So, the problem statement is made. This term is also called as the transient term. So, whenever that uh, Gaunig equation has that term, you can say that the thermal analysis that is being done is a transient analysis. Okay. So, what are the changes that we are uh, needed to make so that we can uh, apply this for a liquid domain that is what we are discussing now. Okay. And that is where we will uh, expand uh, this term applicable to the liquid. So, uh, in that context we need to introduce a concept called material derivative. Okay. I am making it a little simplistic here so that we can apply it to welding in a very quick fashion. Uh, there is a rigorous way of deriving all these things as part of transport phenomena. You could do that separately later on if you want to understand how these things are uh, coming about in the governing equation. So, the idea is as follows. Uh, this uh, operator uh, is uh, to be approximated uh, with a partial differential in case you have basically no advection which implies it is can it can be used for the solid part of the domain. Okay. However, in this in the case when there is a liquid domain then what happens is that the control volume is uh, actually advecting it is moving around. Okay. In other words, uh, when you are looking at the time derivative uh, at t plus delta t the location of the control volume has changed and that has to somehow come into the uh, differentiation uh, and we could do that by saying that this by using the chain rule uh, as this. Okay, and so on. Okay. So, this would uh, then tell us that the uh, variation with respect to the location can also be taken into account and this can be for any variable and we could just put phi there okay, and okay. so which means that you could then uh, look at this and substitute what is known for these things. This is nothing but the u velocity along velocity along the x direction in the melt pool. Uh, this is the v velocity along the uh, y direction in the melt pool and this is the w component. Okay. So, which means that you could write uh, this fellow as this. Okay. So, I would put this here. So, this is uh, a complete derivative or material derivative that is applicable whenever the control volume is getting advected within the domain and it is definitely relevant for the liquid part of the uh, domain where the melt pool is there. And this is a general form because in, in case the velocities are 0, then u v w setting to 0 would recover the partial derivative with respect to the time and that is what is normally seen in most of the uh, uh, equations whenever we are looking at only the solid domain. So, this is what is called as a material derivative and this is what is to be substituted on the left hand side. So, that the equation is now relevant for the liquid domain as well as the solid domain. So, we would just add that term there so that we will make it uh, comfortable. Uh, and compact. Then you would see also that this uh, term can be simplified uh, by a vectorial notation as follows. So, so, I would do that here. So, the vectorial notation would be this way. Okay. So, now you can see that there is an additional term that is coming up and that takes care of the advection within the melt pool for the uh, temperature distribution and uh, if it is not there that means it is a fully solid otherwise the equation is remaining same. So, now this equation is valid for the liquid domain also. So, you have got both the domains covered and you could do them separately. Hmm. Okay. So, this is the generalized uh, equation with the advection and you could uh, uh, look at the terms and uh, tell what they are and we will designate them with some names. So, this is called as the transient term okay, because it has a time derivative and uh, this is called as the advection term, advection or convection term. 
okay. And this is uh, given a name, it is a diffusive term and you can see why because in the derivation of this we have got k into uh, the temperature uh, gradient which is basically the heat flux and that is what is causing the heat diffusion to take place. So, that origin you can keep in mind to know that this is a diffusive term and this is basically volume generation term, volumetric generation term. Okay. So, with uh, this equation and uh, the relevant parameters that are available, you would be able to solve the uh, thermal field within the liquid domain as well as in the solid domain. Okay. And one could ask where is the velocity of the torch, is it the V that we have uh, written here? Uh, no, it is very important to know that uh, U, V, W are the x, y and z components of the velocity of the liquid pool and they are not related to the velocity of the torch. Velocity of the torch is actually embedded in the heat source description itself and uh, you can refer to the lesson on heat sources where the origin of the heat source is made to move with respect to time and that is where the velocity will come. Okay. So, that does not, that is the reason why the velocity is not appearing explicitly anywhere. Now, you can see that there is no uh, mention of latent heat anywhere and latent heat is definitely a large amount of heat that actually uh, plays a role in the weldment because you are going to give that much of heat to melt and that much of heat is also released when it solidifies. So, that also helps in making this weld pool uh, having a shape that uh, leads to the trailing effect also. So, you need to see whether it can come in any anywhere and that is where we come to the uh, relationship where we need to understand how the solid liquid uh, boundary condition has to be kept. So, while this equation is applicable for both solid domain and liquid domain, but for the interface between them we need to have a condition and that condition I am going to now show you and uh, it is as follows. Hmm. So, I would just erase this part. So, in the region where you have solid and liquid, you need to apply what is called the Stefan condition. So, the idea of Stefan condition is as follows. So, the uh, latent heat has to be removed if the liquid has to solidify or it has to be released if solid has to form liquid. Okay. So, that has to be there. And uh, to understand how this equation is written, you could consider a small strip of the domain and that you could do it by looking at this domain and uh, looking at a box and I will draw the box here. So, a box like that you can see and uh, understand how the uh, liquid uh, is going to become solid and that box I will expand and I will show you here itself to expand that box I am going to expand like that and you will see that this boundary is going to be here and this is a solid and this is a liquid. And as the weld torch is moving from left to right, uh, this interface is going upwards. So, so, I will just rotate that domain here and then show you how the boundary condition has to be applied. Okay. So, between the solid and liquid, you are going to apply the boundary condition. Okay. So, the idea is as follows. The heat has to be taken away from the weld pool so that it can solidify and that can happen only when there is a temperature gradient that is going in this direction and the temperature at the interface is going to be the melting point itself or the liquidus. So, that has to be identified here the temperature and this is the distance okay. and you would see that normally the center of the weld pool is much hotter than the melting point which means that you are going to have a temperature profile like that and in the solid you would have a temperature profile like that and therefore, the heat is going to be uh, taken away in this direction. Okay, that is the direction of heat flow. Okay. Now, one can question what are these slopes and how are they related so that the latent heat is taken or not. Okay. So, there must be a heat balance always at any interface and that is what you are going to use okay, to write this condition. The heat flux balance is as follows. Okay. How much ever heat comes in here? In addition, the latent has heat has to be taken away. Okay, that's when the interface can move forward to create solid out of the liquid melt pool. Okay, so which means that what is the amount of heat that is coming in? 
uh, this is a liquid part and this is a solid part. So, which means that you would write for this here minus k in the liquid part ok and uh, this is in the liquid part and this you would write it as and the difference between them must be then equal to the way the uh, latent heat is taken away. So, you would write them this minus that. So, you would write it as minus k L okay, and minus minus k this is S delta T S is equal to the latent heat into the velocity of the interface. Okay, that is solidification velocity okay. and uh, this you can then uh, modify by using the two signs and you would then make it simpler here, you could put a simple plus. So, which means that I can write it uh, in a simpler fashion as follows, I could write it as here k s grad t s minus k l is equal to latent heat times the velocity of the interface. Okay. This is what is called the Stefan condition, okay. which means that if you were to solve this equation in the liquid domain and solid domain, between those two domains this condition must be made as valid. Okay. And uh, what are the parameters? So, this is nothing but the latent heat and this is the local solidification velocity. Is it related? Yes, it is related to tor torch velocity uh, in a trigonometric fashion. The reason being that these shapes are uh, quasi steady state, they are remaining same as the torch is moving and therefore, by looking at the orientation of the normal to this interface with respect to the velocity of the torch, velocity is this way and the normal is this way. So, by looking at this angle this angle theta then you can actually calculate what will be the Vs. So, in other words velocity of the torch will come into the play here and what will be the velocity of the interface at the bottom it is 0 because always the entire thickness of this layer is going to be liquid and as you go upwards the velocity is coming closer and closer to the torch velocity. Okay. So, that is how the variation of the uh, solidification velocity will be happening from bottom to the top and that is how that can be related to the last term. Okay. And these are the two gradients okay. and you can analyze what would happen for the solidification part and liquid uh, formation uh, part and you can see that which of the two gradients are to be larger etcetera. Okay. So, this condition has to be applied. Okay. So, which means that we can now modify the situation as follows. You could say that uh, this equation has to be solved subject to the initial conditions, boundary conditions and the Stefan condition. in between okay, which necessarily means that you need to treat the liquid domain separately from the solid domain okay. and where is the problem? There is a serious problem here because if you want thermal modeling to predict uh, how much of the weld pool is going to form, what is the shape of the weld pool that is to be formed then you have actually a closed loop of a question and that closed loop I will just illustrate here. So, the situation is like this. Uh, if you want to predict this shape, okay, you know that in this region you can use the governing equation for the solid and this you can use the governing equation for the liquid and uh, at this boundary you need to apply the Stefan condition. So, in other words okay, the solution needs location of the fusion zone boundary, but we need the fusion zone boundary to apply the Stefan condition, which means that you can see that you have got a loop. Okay. Unless you know where is the boundary, you cannot apply the Stefan condition and apply unless you apply the Stefan condition, you cannot actually solve to find out what is the 
thermal field. Okay, so that is why you have a low, uh, you have a you know uh, difficulty. Uh, there are ways by which people go about. Uh, normally, you do know what would be the rough shape of the pool, so you can actually approximate it. Solve in a solver uh, using an FEM or control volume method, which we'll be discussing later on. Uh, the thermal field in both these domains separately, applying the boundary condition, and then iterate it by changing the shape such that there is a total thermal balance, so that how much of heat is given by the heat source is equal to how much of heat is lost to the environment and to create this kind of a liquid pool etcetera. And then you can then find out what will be the shape that is stable, okay. So, that one can do. However, it is also very nice if you have an equation which would be actually uh, taking into account both the domains simultaneously, okay. So, there is a uh, uh, need for a single domain equation and a single domain equation can be developed. Uh, with a small uh, variable that comes in addition from whatever we are doing. In addition, there is one more variable that we need to bring and that I will just illustrate now. Okay. To write the single domain equation that will be applicable for the entire you know uh, uh, work piece of the weldment which is basically the fusion zone as well as base material irrespective of whether that material is a solid or liquid at that region, we need to inspect uh, what would be the assumption that we brought in. We have made one assumption that the enthalpy per unit volume is written as rho C p into T minus T ref, T ref is ignored because it is going to be differentiated anyway. And this actually is applicable in this form only either in the solid or in the liquid and the solid it can be taken as T reference to be as 298 Kelvin, in the liquid you have to take the melting point as a reference temperature. But if you want together, then you cannot use the same reference and that is where you have basically this variation. You know how the variation of the enthalpy will be across the phase change, okay. So, if this is the temperature increase and let us say this is the melting point, what happens to the enthalpy as a function of temperature if you notice, it would be going like that and the slope here would be this slope is the C p which is evaluated for the solid phase and this is the C p which is for the liquid phase and this height difference is nothing but your latent heat of fusion or enthalpy of fusion, okay. So, basically you can see that because of this nature you can apply the linear relationship only here or here but not across, okay. That is the reason why you have got the two different domains being written for two different uh, you know uh, manners and the Stefan condition is basically handling how this delta H foreign jump is being uh, taken care, okay. Now, uh, there is a solution to do this and the first solution would be to basically smoothen it out, okay. That solution is basically called as the effective heat capacity method, okay. So, the first method to handle uh, is called the effective heat capacity method. The idea is as follows, you define uh, a heat capacity which is effective in such a way that it takes the value of C p of the solid for temperatures uh, less than the melting point, it takes the value of C p liquid uh, for temperatures that are much greater than the melting point and in between uh, if you notice this plot, you are supposed to actually take it as infinity because it goes vertically up and you can then uh, make that not so bad. You can actually spread it out over a small uh, interval, you could write it like this. You could make this enthalpy change happen over uh, a numerically small width and that width can be taken as let us say this will be let us say T m minus say um, delta T and this can be taken as T m plus delta T by 2. Delta T is basically the freezing range you can say and let us say you can take it as 2 Kelvin for pure metal, so that in numerically you have a possibility to go ahead and do. So, which means that this slope can then be not infinity, but something finite and that would be basically delta H f divided by this temperature difference, which is basically when 
T m minus delta T by 2 less than or equal to T less than or equal to T m plus delta T by 2. So, you could also the, do this. Okay, so, you could uh, make that kind of a arrangement and that way you can actually define what is the effective heat capacity which means that effective heat capacity is nothing but the slope of this smoothly varying function okay, which takes a high value in between but otherwise it will be taking the heat capacity on both the sides. Uh, this uh, method will basically uh, mean that you do not need to take into account what would be the uh, heat uh, cap, uh, uh, what would be the latent heat. Uh, and you do not need to worry about the Stefan uh, condition also. Uh, you can actually apply it to the entire domain and wherever the phase change is happening automatically the heat capacity will slow down or fasten uh, uh, the uh, heat transfer. Okay. Now, the problem is that this is numerically not very stable. The reason being that these values are very high, okay. the slope in this region is very high. So, suddenly when you change the heat capacity to very high values then you need to look at also numerical stability of the scheme that you are using for a solution and unless the time steps are very fine to capture the sudden jump, you may actually miss the phase change and that would cause some uh, erroneous results to come out of your simulation and therefore, this method has uh, known numerical problems. So, there is another alternative solution that is called as the enthalpy method. I will describe that now. Hmm. The alternate method is as follows. It is called the enthalpy method. The idea is that we do not look at the equation with the temperature in it, we actually write this itself, okay, so that we can just simply uh, look at uh, the enthalpy itself and we would write it as follows. We keep everything else same okay, and what we do is that the enthalpy of the control volume that is enthalpy per unit volume. is written like this. It is written as rho C p with the solid into T minus let us say the ambient uh, temperature. This is the enthalpy uh, from the uh, reference temperature T is 298 Kelvin for solids and this is the heat capacity of the solid. Okay. And this is applicable uh, in situations when temperature is less than uh, T m minus delta T by 2 and uh, the enthalpy per unit volume uh, for intermediate regions will be given as uh, this which will basically be rho C p into T minus D m delta T by 2 minus T infinity plus delta H f into the fraction of the liquid. Okay. And uh, this is for the temperatures valid for the temperatures, this is for valid for the temperatures uh, T m minus delta T by 2 less than equal to 2 less than equal to T m minus plus delta T by 2. And for the liquid you would then see that it should be basically more than uh, this and this. So, you would come up like this solid solid. Okay into T m minus delta T by 2 minus T infinity plus this delta H f fraction of liquid is 1 and then plus rho C p into liquid T m minus T minus the reference temperature would then be the melting point okay so this mathematically i have written but essentially what you can see is as follows this is the t infinity okay this is at t infinity and this fellow is tm minus tn delta t by 2 this is tm plus delta t by 2 and this difference is the latent heat and this variation is done linearly with respect to the 
fraction of the liquid. So, fraction of the liquid is 0 at this point and it goes to 1 at this, temp at this temperature T m plus delta T by 2 and beyond this it goes like this. So, you can see that the enthalpy is basically nothing but this plot itself okay, without taking the slopes. Okay. Now, you can actually plug this into the equation which does not have the separation of enthalpy into the temperatures and you would see how you can write it. Okay. So, we would just look at that now. So, you have originally this term, okay. this term you have and uh, you would then expand this fellow as whatever you have written there and you would write it as rho C p for the solid part rho C p into T minus uh, T infinity okay. and uh, this then will become only this. Okay. So, which means that you are actually uh, deriving what would be the term in the solid by the same approximation we have done earlier and this term is coming out. Okay. And when you do the same thing for liquid, what would happen is that you do not have the possibility of just taking it out, you have additional terms that are coming in. So, I will just add those additional terms and you would see how that comes out. Okay. So, this additional term is basically this entire thing, this entire thing is nothing but the enthalpy of the uh, solid up to the melting point plus the latent heat. So, that I will just give you uh, one term delta H the sensible heat uh, from uh, the T infinity of the solid phase uh, T infinity to T m uh, plus delta T by 2 plus delta H F into the liquid fraction that is there. This will be the variation if you want to look at the uh, region between the solid and liquid. So, you can say at the interface region okay. and you can see that this automatically implies that there is a way by which you can actually expand this term with two parts and the first part is basically constant and that will not be coming out and the second part can be then uh, taken as this. So, you can see that in the intermediate region when you expand it you would get a term which is basically the change of the liquid fraction as a function of time. Okay. And when you do that for the uh, fully liquid region again you would see that this term will be coming as a constant that is the entire thing will be coming as a constant and then you would see only the rho C p into d t by d time that would be coming out. Okay. So, I would write that here for the liquid region you would get like this. This, this term is nothing but delta H for the solid phase T infinity from there to T m plus delta T by 2 plus the latent heat itself plus the remaining part rho C p into T minus T m minus delta T by 2. Now, you can see that this is a constant part and therefore, you would see only this part coming in picture and that means that this can be coming it out as you can see that in the solid region and in the liquid region the expression comes to be what is known, but in the interface region it comes to be one extra variable that is nothing but the uh, liquid fraction as a function of uh, time and uh, what would be the value of the liquid fraction in the solid region it will be 0 and the liquid fraction in the liquid region will be 1 and in the interface regions it will be changing from 0 to 1 and the way it changes will affect the latent heat evolution. Okay. So, this is how you can write the equation for the enthalpy balance uh, left hand side the transient term in this fashion and therefore, you will get this term and this term can be taken into the right hand side and then be employed. Okay. So, this is what is called as a, the uh, enthalpy method and uh, the way it works is by introducing a new variable called the liquid fraction. So, you have the way to do that. Hmm. So, I would just write that uh, generic equation uh, now, so that it uh, can combine all these things together.
is equal to then you have got and you would get that in this and you would get the last one as this. So, you can get an equation of this kind of a nature and what you would do is basically uh, keep track of the properties at the different locations. If you are in the location where it is uh, fully solid, you will apply the properties for the two uh, quantities that are here and this thermal conductivity, heat capacity and the density to be that of the solid. And in the case of solid, you also do not have the velocity within the uh, domain, so that has to be 0. And uh, then uh, in the solid, you also have the F L going to 0, so this term also goes up. So, that way you got one equation which will be valid for the solid domain. In the case of the liquid domain, what would happen is again rho and C P will take the values of the liquid k will take the value of the thermal conductivity of the liquid, u v w will be the components of the liquid flow velocity, we will discuss about how the pool velocity can be calculated in a next lesson and once those are there, then you have got these terms and uh, the generation term will be there or will not be there depending upon the problem and uh, F L again is 1 unity at every location and therefore, again this term will not be there. So, this term will go away for the pure fully liquid region also. But what happens in between the solid and liquid regions for those uh, locations in the domain which fall uh, on the interface, what will happen is that you would take these properties which are averaged for the solid and liquid for this and this and you would have basically this term because F L is neither 0 nor 1, but in between and it is changing with the time. So, that is how you can then see that the latent heat evolution or the Stefan condition is an embedded within the Gamanic equation. So, you can say that some equation of this kind uh, can be used for a single domain. So, for the entire domain. So, this would be applicable for the solid part, the liquid part and the interface part of a uh, weld. So, so, that you can use one set of equation for the entire domain and that domain uh, will have boundaries and those boundary conditions can be then applied. So, this is how you would be able to write the uh, thermal uh, modeling uh, governing equation uh, for the entire domain using the enthalpy uh, approach and this is where the enthalpy approach is giving a new variable F L. Okay. Now, one uh, comment on how this F L can be updated. Okay. So, this F L can be updated by looking at how much of enthalpy has come into any location and uh, that is known because you are evaluating this at every uh, uh, time step and you would know that how much of heat is coming in and if the amount of heat that has come in is such such that the temperature has reached the uh, lower bound of the freezing range, then you can start updating the F L and once the temperature has crossed the upper bound of the freezing range, then F L becomes 1 and then it does not get updated. So, there is a step that will be involved in the numerical scheme, uh, which is basically updating the liquid fraction okay, or updating the uh, phase change that is happening uh, in the entire domain. So, with this we will be able to uh, take care of this uh, thermal modeling uh, and we will uh, look at uh, some specific situations now. Okay. What would happen when we have steady state and spot welding and such things we can look up by looking at this equation. So, we already have uh, seen the names for these terms, we saw that this is what is called as a uh, transient term, this is advection term and this is a diffusion term, this is a heat generation term and this is the latent heat evolution term and it has all the features that we need. Okay. Now, in case the weld is such that it is a spot weld. Okay. So, what would it imply is? what does it imply? You know, each of these conditions we have to see what does it imply. By what does it imply by saying that spot weld, spot weld also has a duration over which the entire process is happening. Only thing is that the heat source is not moving. So, you can say that spot weld is no different from continuous weld except for that the heat source is located at a given location okay, and it is not moving. Okay. So, heat source is at an origin okay, which is fixed as the time is changing 
that is all there is nothing else otherwise ok. So, in, in a sense that spot weld is no different from continuous weld except for the heat source description. And uh, very often when you look at a welding uh, the bead is going to have the uniform width along the uh, length of the bead which means that the conditions are quasi stationary or quasi steady state and that you can actually look at. So, you could also ask what happens if it is a steady state. Steady state is nothing but long continuous weld and in such situations what is happening is that with time the weld pool depth shape does not change and that means the time variation is very very uh, negligible which means that this term will not be there ok and that is not to be dropped uh, up front, but to be recognized when you start solving the problem and uh, take into account the initial development of the pool and then noticing that that solution will be working up ok. So, basically if you see any uh, publication without the time term transient term then you can say that it is for a steady state situation ok. And uh, steady state situation is normally also when you do one transformation uh, for the particular equation and that is basically when you convert the equation to be in a moving coordinate system. That is the coordinate system is not fixed at one corner of your work piece, but it is actually fixed with the heat source. So, that as the heat source is moving with respect to the location away from the center of the heat source everything else is basically constant with time the fusion zone uh, dimensions are constant and the uh, rest of the uh, pro pro properties like you know the thermal uh, gradient and such things are also uh, constant as you uh, proceed with the time as the bead is being laid and uh, which means that if you want to uh, understand how the thermal modeling is done in a steady state for a long weld you need to actually switch this equation to moving coordinate system and uh, then uh, look at the solution and moving coordinate system is nothing but basically you are expanding uh, uh, this term and ignoring the uh, time term and that is something that I would just mention here whenever you have uh, the moving coordinate system what would happen is that this term will not be there ok will not be there it will be dropped, but just because it is dropped uh, does not mean it is handling what is happening in moving cord system because there is a transient evolution that is also happening actually you know when when you look at it from the stationary coordinate system. So, what happens is that instead of this term you must have a term that would be count countering like this. Let us say the torch is moving in the y direction instead of this term you must have this term ok. So, that the coordinate system is changing from uh, stationary to moving. So, that the time variable is replaced by y pi d v torch. So, that how much of distance is travelled divided by the velocity of the torch will give you the time that has elapsed ok. So, that is how it can be taken. So, this must come in and if you look at the way it is appearing uh, it can actually come in. Uh, on to the right hand side because everything else on the left hand side is uh, uh, well defined and it can just get absorbed in the heat source term. So, it can come in as a uh, volumetric heat source term ok and anyway rho C p is uh, uh, in the front of it. So, you can say that uh, this term when you multiply so you can see think of like this. this should come on the right hand side into this and that would take care of the moving coin system. So, if you are going to use moving coin system that term will come and it would have a minus sign or a plus sign depending upon the uh, direction of the velocity of the torch ok. So, if it is going forward or backward accordingly the direction has to be done ok. So, which means that if you are going to look at an equation in a uh, journal article in which the transient term is not there and the additional term with the velocity of the torch coming in the right hand side that means that that particular problem is uh, set in the context of a moving coordinate system. If one of them is missing for example, the transient term is not there at the same time this term is also not there then you must inspect what is the problem because naturally it is not meant for a continuous weld ok. So, you cannot apply that kind of an equation for a continuous weld. So, you must read further to see if there is any problem. Okay. So, with this we have basically covered uh, most of the aspects of the
thermal modeling that is uh, setting the equations, the boundary conditions, the terms etc. for uh, thermal uh, profile evaluation in a weldment and uh, by knowing how to solve these equations analytically or numerically we will be able to start drawing the contours or the plots of the temperature as a function of distance, time etc. And what are the various ways of solving these equations is something that we would be discussing in the uh, next class. Okay. So, uh, at this moment I would uh, uh, take a break and we will have in the next lesson where we will be discuss the simplified situations. I want to also already alert you with some simplifications of this equation. Uh, this equation can be simplified with two, two, uh, two dimensional problem or three dimensional problem as follows. You expand this and this term for two dimension or three dimension and then you can see variety of equations coming up. You can expand this without the U and you see that the equation is meant for only laser heating or um, heating of a material with a torch uh, and not with a phase change etc. And you can see that you could uh, drop this term and uh, only keep the remaining ones and you would see that you are in a two domain kind of an approach. So, you can say that this equation uh, covers uh, multiple problems in one go and everything else uh, we see as far as the thermal uh, modeling of the weldment in a rectangle geometry is concerned is like a special case of uh, different different kinds and we will look at a summary of those special cases through a handout that I will upload in the uh, course website. So, with that I will uh, close this lesson and we will continue later on. So, with thank you.